Klicker. Who is the, click the clicker? The rest will be English, I'm afraid. If you went to sleep 50 years ago, and you woke up today, not here, but outside in Guadalajara, it would not look that much different. The main difference will be that you will, be lots of, you will see lots of zombies, people holding something and walking like this. But other than that, the cars will be a little different, the building will be a little different, but by and large, it will not be very different. But I'm going to tell you how in the next 50 years, things will become very, very different. And to explain why, we're going to go back a little bit. Alan Turing, who heard of Alan Turing? Good. So Alan Turing was one of the founding father of computer science, and founding fathers of artificial intelligence. And in 1950, he wrote a very influential paper called Computing Machinery and Intelligence. One of the things he introduced in that paper was the imitation game. Anybody saw the movie? The imitation game. And the paper is really a philosophical paper. It asks the question, can machines be intelligent? And he answers, yes. And he writes towards the end of the paper, I believe that at the end of the century, the 20th century, the use of words and general educated opinion will have altered so much that one will be able to speak of machine thinking without expecting to be contradicted. Maybe he was too optimistic, because by the year 2000, I don't think we thought of computers too intelligent. And in fact, early optimism was a common phenomenon. When people start, this is going back to the 50s and the 60s, people thought, how hard can it be to build an intelligent machines? People are not that smart, we should be able to build such machines. But it was actually more difficult than people realized. It took longer. And because there are lots of hype, after you have a lot of hype, usually you also have disappointment. And so throughout the 70s and the 80s, research in artificial intelligence, we call it AI, was slow. Because there were too many promises, too much hype before that. And people start giving up on AI. And then something happened in the 1990s. In 1997, an IBM computer, Deep Blue, beats Kasparov, who was the world champion in chess, beat it decisively. I'm a professor of computer science at Rice University in Houston, Texas. And IBM invited me to go to New York and watch the tournament. And they paid for the ticket, they paid for the hotel. How could I say no? So I went to New York. And I watched the first game. In the first game, uh, Kasparov was white, and Deep Blue was black, and white has an advantage in chess. In the first game, Kasparov won. And this was on a weekend, on, sun, on Saturday, and I was thinking to myself, well, one day computer will win, but I guess the time has not come yet. So I decided to leave early and go back home. And I did not stay for the second game. 
In the second game, Deep Blue was white and Kasparov was black. And Kasparov laid a trap to Deep Blue. And Deep Blue not only did not fall into the trap, it made the move that was so brilliant that Kasparov could not believe it was done by a machine. He was sure there is a, a team of, ch of expert chess players who came up with this brilliant move. And he lost the second game, and he lost his confidence, and he lost the tournament. And it was a milestone in the history of AI. And then, five years ago, another program by IBM called Watson, and it uh, beat the two greatest players of Jeopardy. Jeopardy is a, is a kind of a quiz game. I don't know if you see it here in Mexico, but very clever uh, uh, questions and hints. And Watson, again, was the winner. And so people realize that AI is making major, major steps. And then another huge step, just earlier this year, in February, a Google program, AlphaGo, it beats the Korean Go champion, Lee Sedol, in a tournament. Now, Go was considered to be a much more difficult game than chess, because chess uh, uh, Deep Blue won by brute force search, just brute force. Brute force does not work for Go. So Google had to use a, 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 a more sophisticated technology. So the way you do the game is the way you think about the game. These are the moves I can make. If I make these moves, these are the moves that my opponents can make, and you get what we call a game tree. But the game tree was too large to search, even for a computer today. So AlphaGo played against itself millions of times and used machine learning techniques to learn to develop intuition. What are good positions and what are good moves? What is intuition? Intuition is when you have an idea how to do something, but you cannot quite explain how you do it. For example, if you ride on a bike, you know how to balance on a bike. But you cannot explain how you do that. You just balance yourself on a bike. Some years ago, I tried to teach, to teach an adult to ride on a bicycle. It's impossible. I could not teach the adult to, to ride on a bicycle. But the fact that there are many things that we know, but we don't know how we know them, was considered a, a, a barrier for AI. 50 years ago, the philosopher Polanyi called it, it's a paradox. We know something, but we don't know to explain it. So how can we write a program to do it? And therefore, people believe, for example, driving, a lot of what you do by driving is just intuition. You don't think it through. You just, you just drive. So how can we build a program to drive if we cannot explain how we drive? Well, it turns out that for the past 10 years, People have been working very hard on automating driving. In 2005, a defense agency, DARPA, a defense research agency, had a grand challenge of driving in Death Valley. An autonomous car, no driver, by Stanford, was able to drive over 130 miles in Death Valley. A year before that, no car was able to drive more than seven miles. But they all learned from the experience and they were able to do 130 miles. Two years later, the same thing, but now in an urban area. Carnegie Mellon University, again, an autonomous car, rides 55 miles without, without a single incident. And by now, I suspect you all have seen this picture. What is this picture? Anybody knows? The Google car, the Google car, right, the Google car. So, who here drives? Anybody drives here? Who is a good driver? You think you are good drivers. We all think we are good drivers. Let's come back to it in a minute. What I'm going to try to tell you is that automating driving is going to be a huge, a huge revolution. So let's talk about transportation revolutions. 5000 BC, we made a huge invention. We invented the wheel. There was a huge, huge, huge invention.
Blank pointer. Help there. Ah, okay. We invented the wheel. There was a huge human invention. We are able to build the pyramids because we had the wheel and we can carry heavy weights. Then, 1,500 years later, we domesticated the horse. Until then, we had to walk. People walk all the way from Africa to America. They walked. But then we invented the horse. And with the horse, we could go long distances much, much faster. The Mongol Empire went from Mongolia all the way to Europe on horseback. The next big transportation invention was the steam locomotive. Now we will be able to have machines taking us places. And using the steam locomotive, we were able to build the United States, which is a whole, what we call a continental country. We were able to build what you see here is a map of the, of the intercontinental railway going all the way from the Midwest all the way to the Pacific, binding the United States as one country. And after that, the next big revolution was the automobile. The Ford Model T was not the first car, but it was the first car that was affordable, and, and lots of people were able to buy it. And it gave us this, okay? Everywhere in the world, that's what you see now that we have a car. So every time we had the transportation revolution, it caused a huge change. For example, if you look at the automobile, it is undoubtedly the most important industrial product of the 20th century. If you look at the urban geography of the United States, where you have cities with center and then suburb and suburb and suburb and suburbs, this could not have been happened without the automobile. The automobile was, gave rise to a huge American industry. 50 years ago, the chairman of the board of uh, General Motors made an announcement. And he, he explained why they're doing something. And uh, he said, this will be very good for GM. And someone asked him, but yes, but will it be good for America? And he said, if it's good for GM, it's good for America. Because GM was American industry. World War II, the United States won World War II because of in, its industrial might. If you know how to make cars, then you can make tanks and trucks and everything else. And for years, they, they, there was something called the car culture. People couldn't wait to get a driving license. It was a symbol of autonomy. This is a, this is a car from a, the Mad Max movie. I mean, there were whole movies were made about the car, car, car culture. But this came with a huge, huge, huge price. And the price is, we are all lousy drivers. I'm sorry to tell all of you who think you're a great driver. Maybe you are the exception. Generally, humans are lousy drivers. Every year, 1.25 million people around, around the globe die from car crashes. We don't know exactly how many injuries are disabled, up to maybe 50 million people. Many of them happens to people in the middle of their life, between 15 and 44. It's the leading cause of death for young people. The damage is over half a trillion US dollar per year. And most of it is caused by human errors. So we have accepted the convenience of the car. I'm not even talking about climate change. Just the death toll is more than one million people every year. It's a huge death toll. Now, there is a gold rush to automate driving. At least 30 companies are trying to do this. The car companies realize if they don't do this, they are going to lose their business. Then the technology companies, Google, Baidu, Apple, they all want to, they think it's going to be all about their software. They all want to do that. And then you have the Uber and the Lyft and all companies like this. The market over the next decade is estimated at two trillion US dollars. This is not pesos, this is US dollars. Now, there are many legal issues to be resolved. I flew into Guadalajara yesterday, this morning when I opened my computer, there is news. Tesla car was responsible yesterday for a fatality. 
somebody die because the software was not able to see an incoming truck. And we will see who's going to have to pay for this. This is, going, this is new. Who is at fault here? Just to show you how tricky it is, people are asking now this question. So there is something called the trolley problem. The trolley problem goes like this. Here is a trolley. It goes on the railway. And it's going to kill five people that are, or you can think, five children are playing on the, on the rail. You're, sta you're standing next to the switch. If you switch it, you're going to move the trolley. It's going to go to the alternative route. It's going to kill one person. Do you switch or do you not switch? You're going to save five lives, kill one person. This is a dilemma, okay? If you switch, you save life, but you're responsible for this person's death. So this is a philosophical dilemma. Well, now that the, 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 the autonomous car will have to make this kind of decisions because the car will go and children will be playing on the street and the car will say, I'm going to kill five children, but if I get off the road, I will kill the driver, but I will save five children. So when you ask people, do they want the cars to do that, they say yes, unless they are the driver. Then they don't want the car to do that. So we have, uh, there are issues to be resolved. It's going to be a huge change. The reason it's going to be a huge change, because right now cars, most of the time, are idle. I mean, I drive 40 minutes a day. I drive to work, I drive back home 20 minutes each direction. Most of the time, the cars just stand there. So car, most of the time, do nothing. If we're going to be able to, if I can just call a car, it will take me where I want, then I won't own a car. It's going to be a huge, huge industrial change. The insurance industry will have to figure out a new model of it. They make a lot of money on, this, on these car crashes. The legal profession, the medical profession. So, you will be you change, but overall, there's going to be, we're going to save million lives per year. This is one of the, if somebody tell you, here's the technology, it will save million lives per year. Of course, of course we should do it. But there's another consequence. The consequence is, what happened to the jobs? Right now, in the United States, there are three and a half million truck drivers. When you add in taxi driver, Uber drivers, and all of these guys, it's about, mostly guys, it's about four million. When you look border, all the US jobs, about 10% involve operating vehicle. Even jobs that we do not think of them as drivers, but think of uh, the, the, the mailman, the main male who drives the car to deliver the mail. Mostly what the mailman does is driving. So all these jobs will disappear. In fact, we can expect the whole what we call supply chain to be automated. From the ports, to the warehouse, in the warehouse, to the delivery, all of this is going to be automated. So we are talking about many, many millions of jobs that will disappear. And this leads into a huge debate among economists whether technology destroys jobs or not. The cla neoclassical economists argue that technology destroys jobs, but it creates new jobs. And at the end, everything is going to work out. They're going to be balanced. All these truck drivers, they will find new jobs, and everything will be fine. Yes, they'll have to adjust to new jobs. Things will work out. So this is the, 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 this is the standard a, a position of economists. But some economists questioned it, and they called themselves neo-Ludites. The Ludites were, were uh, famous in the 18th century for objecting to technology in, in the during the Industrial Revolution in, in England. And they're saying, wait a minute, it's not clear there will be new jobs to replace all the old jobs, because the machines are getting better and better, smarter and smarter, it's possible that there will not be enough new jobs. So this huge debate, and the answer is, what's going to happen? The answer is, no one really knows. So just to give you an idea, this is a debate. 
Is the future going to be the same or different? So until now, technology always destroyed jobs and created new jobs. Will it continue to happen? So here are some studies that I have collected just over the past year. Almost every month, another report comes out with other predictions. One report says 45%. Another report says 33%. Another report says 47%. Another report says 9%. So the answer is, why there are so many predictions? There is a standard phrase that says predictions are hard, especially about the future. But actually, predictions are easy. Everybody can make a prediction. Okay? Now, correct predictions are more difficult. But just issuing predictions is very easy. Just to show you how it easy it is to make prediction, I went and found an a magazine article from 1997, 19 years ago to the day, July 1, 1997. The magazine is called Wired Magazine. It's kind of a very techy magazine. And what did it predict in 1997? It predicted a glorious future. We are facing 25 years of prosperity. We are watching the beginning of a global economic boom. We've entered a period of sustained growth. Of course, what, what this uh, uh, prediction did not foresee was a, a global economic crisis of 2008. So it's easy to make predictions. It's very hard to make correct predictions. So instead of making prediction about the next 25 years, I'd like to spend some time with you looking at the past 25 years, because that's at least Less open to argument what happened in the past 25 years. Now I need to tell you, I'm a computer scientist. My area of research is artificial intelligence. But over the past few years, I've been teaching myself labor economics. And I'm going to give you now a crash course in labor economics. Okay? Things that you did not know that you don't know. So we're going to focus on one test case, which is U.S. manufacturing. Why U.S. manufacturing? We have lots of data on U.S. manufacturing. I will come back a bit later and to talk about Mexico, which I know less about. So there is a myth in the United States that we have lost manufacturing because everything went either to China or to Mexico. What you see here are two curves. This is volume, this is output, this is how much the United States make in dollar adjusted for inflation. And you can see, started in the late 40s, it zigzag, but it goes up and up and up. So the US is an industrial giant. It is, it is roughly the same as, as China. Okay, so the US makes lots of stuff. Okay? It also imports a lot of stuff, but it makes lots of stuff. Now, the other curve, these are employment. What you see is that it goes up, up, up. Around 1980, it, it peaks, and then it goes down, 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 down. So if you see now, you ask yourself now, how many employees we have in 2014? We have less than what we had in 1947. We have lost... Uh, many, many millions of jobs. Why did, why did the U.S. lose so many jobs? It's very simple. Because the, the employees, the workers, have become more and more productive. So again, you can see here, this is around, uh, this is the mid-90s. And you go from here to about 2010, and productivity doubled from $85,000 per year in 1997 to $170,000 in 2010. So because the, the uh, uh, workers have become twice as productive, we roughly need half the number of workers. This is a test. Tesla is a new car. Uh, it's an elect all electric car manufactured in, in the United States. This is what the floor, the factory floor looks like. What do you not see in this picture? There are no people here. Only robots. Only made by robots. So now we have industrial robots, and they can make cars, and we don't need people to do that. 
So what's the result for this? Millions of manufacturing jobs have been lost. And what I'm going to show you now over the next few minutes is that the past 35 years, automation has been very harsh on working class uh, Americans. And it's reasonable to expect that the next 35 years will be equally harsh, if not harsher, because millions of jobs again of drivers will be lost. So here is what you need to know. There are four, num there are four numbers you need to know about economics. One is GDP, gross domestic product. How much stuff do we make? One number. Productivity. How good we are at making this stuff in particular. Are we getting better every year in making more and more stuff? And then, how many jobs do we have? And fourth, how much money do we get? So, productivity, GDP, jobs, wages. Now, what drive economic growth? Everyone, every economist will tell you productivity growth drive economic growth. For the economy to grow, for us to do better and better every year, we need to be smarter and, and be uh, more productive as we manufacture stuff. What you see here is this four number from 1953 until 1980, they go together. So DOS have become more productive, GDP grew, we created jobs, and we paid people better and better. So this was very good. This was the good life, you can say. And you can think, OK, this number must go together. Well, it turns out not quite. Here's what happened after 1980. Productivity continued to increase, and GDP grows. But we're creating fewer jobs, and salaries are not growing. People, the money does not, does not the gains does not distribute evenly. This is a, a, when I saw this chart, I gasped. This shows what it says, real average hourly earning of production and non-supervisory, non-management employees, private. And what you see here, that once you adjust it for inflation, this is 1968, this is roughly, uh, this is 2015. Wages have been stagnant for, for production workers for 40 years. So people are not doing better. So something has gone terribly wrong. And over the last few years, it's become very common to talk about inequality. So what we see here again, what happened from 1980 till 2013, and what we see here, this is the bottom 90%, and, and people actually have lost ground. And who is doing better? This is the top 10%, the top 1%, the top 0.1%, and the top 0.01%. So most of the money goes to the very rich, and the bottom 90% have actually lost ground. And I will go on and on. What happens here is that, as you see, the rich get richer. We have more and more poor people. And the middle class, which is normally considered to be the mainstay of the society, because these are the people who consume and they sustain the economy, the middle class has lost ground. We have fewer and fewer people in the middle class in the United States. So when you look at poverty, so if you ask, if you see how many people have five years of poverty, it's about 12%. But if you ask people, did you have poverty for one year? By the time, excuse me, by the time people reach age 60, 40% have experienced at least one year of poverty. 40%, that's a very, very high number. 40% experience at least one year of poverty. And very recently, they went and did ask people, if you have an unexpected expense of $400, can you handle it? 47% say no. They asked them, if you have a $1,000 unexpected expense, can you handle it? $1,000. Two thirds of the people says, no, I cannot handle, I have no savings, I cannot handle $1,000 unexpected expense. 
So these people are living very, very, what we call precariously. They're living on the edge. Now, you hear a lot about unemployment is below 5%. But this statistic is, is fairly meaningless statistics because it does not describe how many people gave up on looking for a job. Once you give up on looking for a job, you don't count anymore in unemployment. If you look at what's called labor force participation, which look at the, what percentage of the, of the adult population is in the labor market, either working or looking for a job, this is called labor force participation. And again, you can see that this number, going back to 1990, keeps going down. Fewer and fewer Americans are in the job market. And, and if you try, if you zoom in and you see what's going on, you realize that, that technology plays a key role. So where does technology eat jobs? In the middle. So if the jobs take a very low skill job, cleaning tables in a restaurant, everybody can do it. It's very hard to build a robot to do it, actually. You have to do, you have to be very dexterous, you have to be very agile, it's very difficult to automate it. It will be very, very expensive. But the people who clean jobs, who, who clean tables in a restaurant, we don't pay them very much, not in the United States, I suspect not here, so it doesn't make sense to automate it. These are low skill jobs, so we have lots of jobs, they don't pay well. At the high end of the skill job, people who give talks at campus party, that's hard to automate. And so you have, we're creating jobs there. In the middle, these are middle skill jobs, we are losing jobs. Like people who used to work on the production line, this was considered middle skill job, and we have lost these jobs. Drivers, this is a middle skill job, we're going to lose these jobs. And technology eats the job from the inside out. And economists divide all jobs into, by two dimensions. Is it cognitive? Do you sit in the office, think about uh, numbers or words, and you think that's cognitive job, or do you work with your hands? This is one, di one division, Co cognitive versus manual. The other one is routine versus non-routine. Do you do the same thing again, again, and again? Or do you deal with a lot of unexpected situation? You have to do problem solving. And that's non-routine. And what you see here is that technology eats jobs that are routine. It doesn't matter whether they're cognitive or manual. If the job is routine, then people can, can find a way to automate it. Non-routine jobs, they're safer for a while. And this is statistic that came out very recently. When you look at the mortality of people between 45 and 54, from 1990 to 2010, over 20 years, generally healthcare gets better and better, and you expect mortality to go down. And it has gone down for, in many countries and any demographic group, except for one group, which is US white. These are working class Americans, middle-aged working class American. And you look, what do they die from? It's not from disease. They die from suicide and from substance abuse. So obviously these people are very unhappy people. We don't know exactly why, but we suspect it has to do with the loss of jobs. And in fact, there is something very interesting. Somebody has looked at the data, voting district by voting district, and they find out that where you see more middle-aged white Americans dying, more people are voting for Donald Trump, which I can imagine he's not very popular in Mexico, right? I chose this picture intentionally. So what about other countries? So let's look at China, for example. So China, you see the same phenomenon. This is volume. The industry continues to grow. This is employment, and you see it peaked. The peak was in the mid-90s, and it's been generally going down since then. So the Chinese are doing what the U.S. has done. They're automating their industry. Now, why are they automating their industry? 
because wages are going up in China. So this shows US versus China, look at manufacturing wages, and you can see the US is the bottom, it's almost flat. In China, it has grown, it's almost doubled. So workers have become more expensive, and the cost of industrial robots is coming down. So they're buying robots and they're replacing people by robot. Now what about Mexico? I have to say I had a hard time finding the data, but I did find this data that wages have not been growing up in Mexico as fast as they have in, uh, in, uh, in China. You can see in China, they're more than doubled. In Mexico, they're almost flat. So the bad news is that people are not seeing the wages go up. But the good news is that the industry, in the, the manufacturing in uh, Mexico is not declining. This is in terms of number of people who are working in the industry. So here you see uh, we have the employment index, which is the, the proportion of people working in the industry, and you see that Mexican manufacturing industry is continuing to grow. But this is what's happening for a while. You have to remember, the cost of industrial robots is continuing to go down. Okay? So here, people are paid less than they're paid in the United States, so it will take longer, but nobody is immune from automation. So this was the crash course in labor economics. Now, until a few years ago, if you came and say technology has adverse effects for workers, people would laugh at you. They would not take you seriously. But over the last few years, this has changed. For example, Gartner is a consulting firm, very serious, a blue chip consulting firm, and they wrote, wrote a report. They were among the first to come up with a report saying smart machine will have widespread and deep business impact through 2020. So suddenly, people are starting to take this very, very seriously, the possibility, while technology has a lot of good effects, we saw automatic driving will save about a million lives per year, but it, will have very, very, it may have very, very bad impact on the drivers who are going to lose their jobs. Now, even if we look at all this data, and some people still argue about the data, what we don't know is, in economics, why things happen the way they happen. And why is that? We cannot run experiments. So we know the facts. But what caused, for example, we saw that the uh, mortality of middle, middle class, middle, uh, working class American is up. But why? Nobody really knows for sure. We don't, there are speculations. Um, there are other reasons. The other would be globalization. Uh, there could be many reasons. But they have done in 2014 a major poll among about 1,800 economists and asked them, do they agree with this statement? Information technology and automations are a central reason why median wages have been stagnant in the United States over the past decade despite rising productivity. So no majority for this yet, but we have a plurality. 43 said yes, they are agree. 30 are uncertain, and only 28% disagree with this. So economists more and more believe that automation is a key factor in the decline of manufacturing employees in the United States. So why is it, why should it be different this time? For 200 years, we've been building machines. What is different this time? Well, if you think about it, as we built machines, we had to find domains where people could compete with machines. So the machines were stronger, and then they become faster. But we are smarter, and there are other things. We are more dexterous than machines. We are more agile than machines. But the machines are getting better and better. What's left if, the, if we continue, if the machine continues to improve in this, in this uh, pace, how can we compete with machines? So there is a concept called a tipping point. Imagine that I put, when I was a child, uh, we had to boil milk. This was before we didn't have pasteurized milk. We'll have to boil milk. You buy it and boil it. And uh, I would stand there. My mother would tell me to watch the milk. And I would stand there looking, and nothing happened, nothing happens. Then I would look away, and the milk would be all over the place. This is called the tipping point. So it could be that we, that we are automating, automate, automating, and we are going to get to a tipping point. 
And we could imagine what would have happened if in, in, 2000, in, in 1910, two horses would be talking about the disappearing jobs for horses because of automobiles and tractors. And one horse would say, don't worry, there will always be new jobs for horses. Always people inventing new machines, there will be new jobs for horses. As it happens, 1915 was the peak year for horses, and now horses almost have no jobs other than basically either as pets or entertainment. Once in a while, you still you see policemen riding horses, but job, jobs for horses have gone away. So, what about new jobs? People promise that technology will create new jobs. So, two, two economists have looked at all US jobs and asked, how many jobs do we have in, in 2010 that did not exist in 2000? The answer was a small fraction, half a percent. All this idea that we're generating all these new jobs, we're just not generating so many new jobs. It's a real problem. Let me try to, to close it. As a new report came out just a year ago, and they said the central domestic policy challenge for the 21st century is to ensure middle class prosperity. This is the central problem. And Nigel Cameron, a, a British journalist, wrote, will a world without work be heaven or hell? Now is the time to think it through. What happens when jobs disappear? And just uh, two weeks ago, there was an interview with President Obama. And remember, four years ago, nobody would discuss this issue. But now, here is what Obama said. As we move towards an economy, or because of automation, you need fewer people to make more and more stuff. More and more of us are going to move to the, into the service sector. The service sector historically has been a low-wage sector. So we are losing jobs in manufacturing. We are moving to services. Service jobs do not pay very well. And then he added, because of automation, because of globalization, we are going to have to examine the social compact. The social compact is the way society operates, the agreement between the workers, the government, and the industry. The same way we did early in the 19th century, and then again during and after the Great Depression. We have rethought how we organize our socioeconomic life. And now technology is going to force us to do it again. Thank you very much. Is there a ball with the mic here? Hello? Yes. I, f I find it quite interesting what you were saying. Hold it closer to your mouth. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, you've talked about how technology can change uh, mortal, mortality rate. And Hold it closer, you, closer. Do you think there's a correlation between um, birth rate and the technology? Can it change it? I repeat the question, please. Can technology and all these changes change in society birth rate? So, one thing that sometimes people hear about these effects of technology and they would like to say, can we stop? Can we stop technology? The answer is not really. We cannot stop technology. Because technology, it's almost as if it has a will of its own. If I don't think of this smart idea, somebody else will, right? If we decide not to do it here, somebody will come up with this idea there. So if you look over the course of human history, it's a history of technology at the same, at the same pace, right? I talked about inventing the wheel. You know, of course, we, in, we discovered fire. We keep discovering things. So the idea is that we're going to stop it, not going to happen. What we have done, each time we had technology forcing us to rethink how we live our lives, okay? And we've done it many times, and we'll have to do it again. It's always very painful, very difficult, 
I mean, if you look what's happening now in the, in the US with the election, shows you how painful people are trying to figure out what to do. Just what happened last week in the United Kingdom is another reaction. Change is painful. Everybody wants change. Nobody wants to change. Other people should change. It's painful. It's going to be painful. Over there. Hello? Yes. You were saying that, well, it, the proportion of, let's say, a people that are getting unemployed by the, this lack of, the, oh, okay, the, the capacity of automation to, to do these kind of jobs, but let's say, what, what's this relationship between the, the, the capacity about this, the, the working people to create more jobs about with technology, for example, we, websites, and all this about internet, throughout the internet, you, you have all these kind of jobs. You. So what we saw is the technology is the jobs in the middle. It creates new jobs upskill, and new jobs that what we call downskill, okay? So imagine you are a truck driver. You've been driving trucks now for 20 years and now you're being replaced by an automated truck. So you could say, okay, I'm going, to become a, I'm going to become a software developer for automated trucks. This will be called what we call upskilling. You will upgrade your skills. Or you can say, I'm going to wash trucks using a, a hose, okay? This will be downskilling. So you can upskill or downskill. Now, think about it. The people who drive trucks, usually they don't have college education. Maybe they have finished high school, but there is a good paying job. How many of them do you think will upskill? And how many of them will downskill? So the answer is that for people who come to campus party, there'll be lots of good jobs. But the people who drive trucks, not so much. Okay? So, Keep going to hackathon, that's a good thing, because this is where the new jobs will be. But it's not clear that people are going to lose their jobs, will be able to move to the new jobs. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> don't you think, well, technology progress is too fast, right? So what I think that uh, educational progress is too slow, so it can't keep up, with the technology we have. That's why people lose their jobs. What do you think about it? So it's very clear that education is going to be crucial here because we saw the jobs are moving up skill. So even if you look generally, let's look at the, at the economy right now in the United States. For people with good education, especially for people with technical education, the economy is very good, okay? I suspect that people here are mostly people with good, good education and the economy is good. Um, I don't know what are the numbers in Mexico. Maybe you can tell me. In the United States, maybe 30% of the, of the people go to college. 70% of the people do not go to college. 70%. We have to think about jobs for these people. These are the people that right now are voting for Donald Trump. Okay? They're unhappy. The economy is not working for them. They want to an outsider. So they're voting for Donald Trump. So we have to think about, when we think about the economy, to say everybody should become, everybody should go to hackathons. Everybody should become, a, you know, a, a write apps. It's not a solution for society as a whole. We have to think, we have to be inclusive. We have to think of the people who have high skills. And we have to think what to do about the people who will never be able to do that. And driving was, driving was a wonderful job, right? Because you don't need too many skills to do it. Almost anybody can be trained to be a driver. And it paid well. They're losing the jobs. We have to think as a society about people in a very broad way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do you have an idea of, of the future of what a government should do to avoid this or any idea of what to do? 
because we already know the problem and the projection, the future that is going to happen if we continue doing this. But you have an idea of what should so we the, there is done? There is an idea that's being discussed right now. It's very controversial. It's called universal basic income. And the idea is that at least in, in richer countries, in developed countries, that there is, people say there is enough money that basically, you, instead of having, right now we have welfare and unemployment and social security and Obamacare, we have many, many programs to help people. The idea is get rid of all of them. Instead, give everybody a check every month. So everybody gets basic living guaranteed. Okay, it's also called basic income guarantee. And this turns out, you could, this sounds like a very liberal, very socialist idea, but it was actually a conservative idea in the beginning. The reason is because very conservative, they hate big government. So it says you can get rid of many, many government bureaucracies that decide who should get the money, because everybody will get the money. The other reason to do it, the labor market will become more efficient. Because we saw many people are living paycheck to paycheck. So they may, have a, they may have a job that they hate, but they cannot afford to, to quit and look for another job. And so many employers take advantage of them. Okay, they, they pay them very little, but these people don't have the flexibility to look for another job. If everybody had universal basic income, people say the job market will become more competitive. The employers will have to compete for people, will become a better market. Uh, it, it just went on the ballot. In a, a, just a few weeks ago in, in one canton in Switzerland, and it lost. But if you look at the demographics, just like we saw with the vote in the UK, there was a big gap between older people and younger people. And many younger people were in favor more than the older people. So that's one example of how we change, how we think about what I say, our socioeconomic life. Hi. Um, I have an enterprise that we um, change the mindset of the... Closer, closer. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, I have a, an enterprise that we sell um, financial modeling classes, and we try to change the mindset of the employees, um, for example, the people that work at HP, IBM here. The problem is that the, most of the people tell me that that money is not necessary to be expended because they already have their bachelor and they don't need to know how to use Excel since they have used it all along the way and they use it well. So which will be the argument that you give to those people that don't invest in their con continued education? So <clears throat> I used to work for IBM. And when you work for IBM, the expectation was you're going to join IBM sometimes in your 20s, and you will work for IBM for 40 years. This was the expectation. And the company had high expectations of you, but they viewed that they have a huge investment in you because they're going to employ you for 40 years. So they will send you to training and to courses to make sure that you, that you move together with technology. Uh, in the mid-90s, IBM decided we can't do it anymore. So th this loyal connection, we are, it's like Catholic marriage that they used to have between companies and employees was severed. Now, yeah, you can go whenever you want. We can fire you whenever we want. As a result, the companies don't have incentive to invest in people the way they used to. And so, and in technology, things change all the time. So I would say that the basic advice to everybody your biggest investment is what is between your ears, okay? Don't count on anybody else to keep it current, okay? My brother is a, works in the IT industry, and he is an expert on backroom IT processing for banks. But if he loses these jobs, that's it. There's no other job for him. Because that's the one thing he, you know, he doesn't know anything about apps and schmaps, okay? He knows about all technology. He's very, very good at it. But the key is you cannot count on anyone else to upgrade your skills all the time. You have to run to stay in place. Just like in Alice in Wonderland, I don't know if you remember, the Red Queen says, you have to run to stay in place. Thank you. Uh... 
Hi. Yeah. Well, it's more than like an opinion for me, but well, I'm a software developer, and I will have a job, I should say. But my opinion here is machines are made by humans. Our humans are not perfect. Even if machines are, out, are automatizing the jobs, machines are still in need of humans, even with the, not the smartest ones. I mean, there's an example of mine. Well, there's a security system. There's always one guy who can break it. Break it, always, always. That's for me. It's a, it's a kind of evolution. Yeah. And well, let's make it like a a, a, a cab driver. A cab driver have certain skills and have like mm, he can hack his job. Yeah. He knows tricks that machines doesn't not. Does not, sorry. So, so machines will still need that people to learn right, more and right. more and more and more. Yeah. Maybe people are, people are afraid right now because, yeah, machines are gaining a lot of terrain and a lot of, a lot of jobs. But so we, we have even think of the basic thing of just repairing stuff, okay? Repairing computers, repairing the sound system. We need people to do that, right? We don't have good machines to do that. But it, this does not produce enough jobs. Yeah. That, you know, it's a question of, partly it's a question of numbers, you know? We don't have enough, we don't need the numbers to justify people who will fix bugs and this. At the end of the day, we don't have enough jobs there. If you look at the people who just do repair jobs, okay? When your uh, computer breaks down, when your dishwasher breaks down, you still need people to, to repair this. The numbers, the, the numbers don't play out, yeah, unfortunately. But, uh, well, for that, my question was, uh, with this that you explained, uh, maybe not a job you, well, in the future, people, I think, people just don't need to look for a job, actually. Just need to look for another kind of life. Yeah. Because if you can merge, no, you can fusion, with a machine. Machines can always be learning and learning and learning. Maybe there's this time when, this time, yeah, this time when uh, we don't need to look for jobs. If you're not a smart one, we just need to look for another type of life. Okay, last question. Thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, well, uh, well, this re well, new revolution of the robotics, I think, I mean, that is a personal idea that uh, there will be close, a... Close, Okay. There will be a day when, I mean, all the resources that we need on there will be satisfied by, by I mean, all the robotics work. So my question is, uh, what do you think will be the, I mean, uh, the posture of the of the economies, of the countries, of the big giants in, in manufacturing about, I mean, if there is a point when we uh, have everything we, we want, I mean, what would be uh, well, the, the opinion of, of the rich people or uh, any economy that is against, I don't know, I mean, uh, that everyone has everything? So. It's interesting to see, you start to see some of the rich people start to get very worried. Because if you look at the history, we have the Industrial Revolution. It made some, many people very, very rich. And the rich people start to get very nervous, okay? If you have only 1% of people are rich, and the rest of the people here are, are not so rich. So the rich people said, let's do something about it. And so if you look, for example, uh, uh, England is a good example. They started legislating all kind of social legislation. And the rich people were in support because they were very nervous what will happen if they don't have it. For example, uh, uh, in, in Prussia, in, in uh, Bismarck was a, was a prime minister, he instituted retirement because he was worried, he was looking what happened with socialism. He was, he was very nervous about socialism. So very often the fear of socialism is the thing that drove countries to adopt all kind of reforms. And I think we're going to see the same kind of thing. There will be reforms, and the people who 
are very nervous about socialism, they will be in favor of these reforms. Thank you all very much. Thank you.